Uh, let me introduce our session for moderator. Our moderator has a PhD in archaeology from the University of Cambridge, United Kingdom, with specializations in cultural archaeology, mortuary, mortuary analysis, identity, and gender in archaeology. The former director and currently an associate professor in UPASP. Let us all welcome, and I am going to pass the mic to Dr. Mary Grace Dualhati Pareto Tesoro. Um, Grace? Hello. Good morning. Ha, buo talaga yung pangalan. Okay. Um, any, can, is my, uh, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, yes okay. ma'am. Very clear. Yes, we can hear you. All right. Thank you very and, much. And ang ganda ng hikaw mo. Oo, salamat. All right. For this, uh, for the second session, for the second day, of the ASP's 26th anniversary. We have two speakers, and each speaker has uh, 15 minutes to share their talk. And I'm glad that Jose Alain Austria is with us today and that he is feeling well. So our first speaker, uh, Alain, completed his MA in history at De La Salle University, Manila, in 2003, and his diploma in archaeology at ASP in 2019. His published works include a wide array of interests such as sacred art history, funerary spaces, popular piety, and popular piety. He is currently an assistant professor in history at De La Salle College of St. Vidil. Let's all welcome Jose Alain Austria. Clap, Thank clap, very, clap. <laughs> Thank you very much, Grace. Good morning to all of you. Uh, the Cult of the Brown Madonna in early colonial Tagalog society, Spanish and indigenous interpretations. Um, with colonization came a new religion and with the new religion came new ways of seeing or visualizing the supernatural. And of course, we do have images in the case of the Philippines in the pre-colonial era. And of course, the new religion, Christianity, also brought with it its new iconography. But for now, we shall focus our attention on the concept of the black or the brown Madonna. In its traditional definition, the black Madonna refers to any European, medieval European image of the Virgin Mary that is colored black, normally the Virgin Mary with child, colored black, brown or whatever shade there is. And it was later on expanded to include all the predominantly brown images that were created by indigenous peoples in what is now the Americas and consequently the Philippines. So as long as it is from black to brown, whether it is carrying the child Jesus or not, it's considered as part of that mysterious trend of depicting the Virgin Mary as a dark-skinned woman. And this is also understood as one of the more powerful archetypes in sacred, um, sacred legends and in religion, in formal religion as well. And so we would like to focus our attention on the concept of the mysterious brown Madonnas of the Philippines. You see, the concept of the Virgen Morenita or the Brown Virgin is quite controversial in the early stages of colonization, primarily because Mary, which is just one person, is perceived to have several faces. On one hand, you have the colonizers who perceive her as one of them, their guide, their conquistadora, um, their, their connection with Spain, and an affirmation of the morality and the righteousness of their colonial venture. On the other hand, you have an indigenous population which sees the Virgin Mary as one of them, an Indio. She who affirms her indigenous, her their indigenous Christian identity, and she who at times can even be a rallying point for resistance against the systematic oppression of the colonizer. Of course, they call this particular conundrum the Guadalupe conundrum, the virgin 
the brown virgin of Mexico, meaning two different things to two different groups of people. And although she stayed there on and was venerated by both sides, eventually it reached the point that this became the symbol of resistance against Spanish rule. And this particular phenomenon is um, repeated again and again all over Latin America, in Mexico, in Uruguay, in Peru. And I am interested as to whether such dynamics are also applicable to the farthest outpost of the empire, which is the Philippines. In my decision to come up with the discussion of the Brown Manonas, I decided to focus on first 1571 to 1647 in the Tagalog region. This was roughly during the period wherein the conquista was starting up to 1647, when at least Spanish power was consolidated. In short, the colonization process was still ongoing and the first three generations of Filipinos uh, Christians were still very much alive, especially people who still have memories of the Tagalog region before the Spaniards entered the picture. So I chose three images, Nuestra Señora de Guía near Manila, uh, Nuestra Señora de Caizasay in Taal, and the Nuestra Señora de Antipolo uh, far away north in what is then Morong province. Let us talk first about the case of the, the Virgen de Guía. Now, the Virgen de Guía is the oldest Marian image in the Philippines. It's made of Molave, and it is an image that shows some Oriental features, which includes, among other things, a sarong or a tapis in her skirt. Um, she is a debulto statue, which means she's carved to be fully dressed, but she is bald, meaning um, her head was meant to really have a wig, which really points to the idea that this is indeed an image of the Virgin Mary. Where it came from or who made it, we don't know, but it was found by the troops of the conquistador Miguel Lopez de Legazpi on May 19, 1571, just after the initial conquest of the polity of Manila. And they found her being worshiped, probably uh, as many people say, even as like a diwata or a poon, atop an altar made of pandan leaves and palm fronts. So when this was found, it was immediately hurled back to the metropole, which is now Intramuros, and they told them that this is a good sign. Um, this is, shall I say, a good symbolism, an affirmation from heaven that what we've just done is actually right, and she's here protecting us. Now, what's interesting about this cult is the fact that the Spaniards interpreted her pre-arrival, meaning she predated the Spaniards in this particular region as a way to prepare for their arrival. And that's why the Nuestra Señora de Guía, which is a title which is not in the Philippines, okay? It's a title that is known in Spain, was given to her because she's our guide and therefore it is indeed our noble task in conquering the Tagalogs for Spain. So therefore it became important for the Spaniards to, it is their moral duty to retrieve this particular image from pagan worship and that's how they called uh, Filipino religious practices at the time and to have her enshrined where she truly belongs, and that is a Spanish Manila. And ironically, though, in the indigenous interpretation, it appears that she, she is revered as some sort of a poon or a diwata. In fact, in the story, it appears that this virgin would, up, would be brought to the metropole in what will eventually become Intramuros, and then will find herself going back, will reappear, in what is now Ermita. The Spaniards would get her back again to the cathedral. She would reappear. And so the people would reinterpret as, hey, she likes it here. She doesn't like it there. She likes it the way she... And so eventually this became a tug of war between the two groups until eventually the Spaniards gave in. Okay, we will have them there. Okay, she will stay there in Ermita. But you know, we have to venerate her according to our own means. So in this particular narrative, there seems to be a form of subjugation. Yes, there is a tension on her understand, 
on how she is to be understood. But what appears now is that eventually the Tagalog society eventually gave in to the Spanish way of doing things. And they start dressing her according to the Spanish mode of things, according to the Spanish tradition, because she is the Immaculate Conception. She's the patroness of Manila and what have you. However, the experience is not, this experience is not necessarily the pattern in other cults of the Brown Madonna in the Tagalog region. Sometime in 1603, a small image again of the Immaculate Conception, which seems to be a favorite image in the Tagalog region, uh, was allegedly found along the Pansipit River in Batangas. And so this image was named the Virgin of Kaisasai because her epiphany, her discovery was supposedly accompanied by a big flock of kasai kasais or what we call a salaksak. In, uh, these are colored kingfishers. And so they named her after that particular sub, Immaculada Concepcion or Virgen de Kasai Kasai or eventually Virgen de Kaisasai. The image is also very, very small, roughly 10 inches. And it seems to be more of the Sino-Philippine style of craftsmanship. Um, she's similar to Kuan Yin, but more of the brown varnish with the reddish blue color. Now, it appears again that the narrative of the Virgin of Kaisasai is similar to that of Ermita. One thing, she always appears and disappears in a particular place. Apparently, people are saying, oh, the reason why she appears appears always in this place is because this is where she wants her shrine to be built. And that shrine eventually became the shrine at Labak. But what makes the Virgin of Kaisasai different is that long after its, its um, cult was established, is that there came a series of three to four apparitions. I would now use the term form, okay? Four apparitions that uh, happened between 1611 to 1619, and a fourth one will be recorded in 1639. All of them involving native people. All of them were investigated by the church. So this makes this the first investigated apparition claims in the Philippines. There seems to be no decision as to the supernaturality of the event, although there is an approval of faith expression, which now explains why the, the, you know, the well of Santa Lucia and all the other very early edifices there. Now, what's unique about these Marian apparitions is that they tend to be very archaic and the symbolism is so rich in local flavor. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to discuss it during the presentation. Probably later, some of you would like to ask the archaicness of these symbolisms. Okay, now apparitions, however, are quite very, very um, rare in the early stages of colonial rule in the Tagalog region. But what's interesting is that the story of the Virgin of Kaisasai seems to be similar to the foundling virgins of Spain and Latin America. And there's the prominence always of the elements of body of water, a cave, a tree, and this is already recognized as miraculous in itself. So this somehow would start a pattern. Practically every Virgin Mary or saint in the Philippines would be found atop a tree on the cave, retrieved from the sea or any body of water. And this is universally recognized as archetypal. But uh, Father Cruz, uh, the Jesuit historian, made a very good study of this in 2002. And took notice of the fact that in the case of the apparitions of the Brown Madonna in Kaisasai, there is a conscious overturning of the hierarchy wherein all the protagonists are particularly people who belongs to the marginalized class. Women, in this case, another, a slave girl. And in 1639, a Chinese guy who was actually one of the victims of the Chinese massacres of 1639. So it seems that in Kaisasai, the indigenous expression of faith seems to be more powerful or more obvious with the Lua, etc. And although it is under the watch of the Augustinians, it seems to be more tolerant of native expressions of faith, even syncretism, as in the case of 
uh, the Chinese Filipinos who would eventually join as members of the devotees of the Virgin of Kaisasai. But no other brown Madonna would uh, capture the attention of the Filipino or the Tagalog more than the Mexican Our Lady of Peace of Good Voyage. Now, what's interesting about this particular cult is that it was already, it was a cult that was introduced from above. And um, Monina Mercado in her study is very clear about this. It is a well-organized attempt to create a popular devotion on the part of the colonial elite. In fact, many people are saying that this is one devotion that came with so much hype. It is already popular even before it arrived in the Philippines. So this Mexican image actually was enshrined somewhere in Acapulco until Juan Nino de Tabora convinced the parish priest to sell it to me because I fell in love with it, uh, made it the patron of her gal of his trip, and eventually um, created a you know a, a very colorful reception for it in 1626. So it stayed in Manila for quite a while until his death, and later was given to the Jesuit missions in Antipolo. Okay, and it was then that she began to manifest specific miraculous uh, stuff, no apparitions, but she was known to be disappearing and appearing atop a Tipolo tree, apparently saying that this is where she wanted her shrine to be in. Again, another commonality with the two other cases. But what's more interesting with Our Lady of Peace and Good Voyage is that no other Madonna figured prominently in socio-political upheavals, such as the Chinese rebellion of 1639, uh, the Dutch invasion of 1646, and even the siege of Cavite by the Dutch in 1647, than this one. So to some extent, um, Our Lady of Antipolo, from the point of view of the Spaniards, can be considered as the protectress of institutions and locales that play prominently in the geopolitical or economic life of the fledgling colony, the Manila Galleons, the Port of Cavite, the Navy, etc. So to some extent, she's also seen as the celestial queen or governor general of the Philippines. And that explains the, the, the crown and all the regalia, but more importantly, the importance of the governor general's baton, which is hiding, she is holding in her hand. In fact, it has become customary for some governor generals to literally surrender to her the conduct of government of the colony when things are really very bad. Now, she is also known to side with Spanish colonial forces when they are threatened by external elements, particularly by the Chinese rebels and the Dutch. And it is also interesting to note that it is the Spanish establishment which actually bestowed upon her the titled Nuestra Señora de la Paz, even the Our Lady of Peace and Good Voyage. So to some extent, she is transformed into the most popular virgin of predilection of the Spanish, the somewhat like the Del Pilar of the Tagalog region. But somehow, the local population sees her differently. Among the Tagalogs, particularly the people of Antipolo, they are not interested in her they simply call her Birhen ng Antipolo. They are not interested so much in her active involvement in political upheavals. For the Tagalog, she's revered more as a supernatural mother who is not concerned with political concerns, but more with domestic issues. I don't have food. Nalunod ng anak ko. Sasaktan ako ng asawa ko. If you look closely at the miracles of the Virgin of Antipolo as recorded from 1626 up until the 18th century, most of these are very, very domestic issues, which has something to do with the home and the family. Nothing profound as saving the country from an invasion or whatsoever. She is also revered as the health of the sick. And as everybody knows, every time the pilgrimage season enters the picture, most of them would describe Antipolo as the town of the maimed, the blind, the poor, practically all miseries associated with sickness can be found in Antipolo. Why? Because 
it is profoundly because she is the health of the sick. So for all its local color and pageantry, the devotion to the Our Lady of Antipolo among the Tagalogs tends to be very personal and intimate more than sociopolitical. And Our Lady, in their stories, she never appeared in an apparition, but she visits her people, but only in the disguise of a Tagalog woman, either an old woman, a beautiful Tagalog woman, but always as one of us, sense all the supernatural elements. So it appears now when you look at all these stuff, these concluding thoughts are not necessarily conclusive because the study is still in its initial stages. But I want to end this with the following. The brown color of the Virgin did not have any racial connotations at all with both colonial Tagalog and Spanish masters. Uh, in contrast with that of Latin America, they don't see the brown color of the Virgin as anything racial or ethno-linguistic. It is just part of her mystique as an icon and the artistic license of the artist. Uh, there is a point in this history at this early stage that indeed Spanish devotees have a tendency to see these thriving cults as an affirmation of the righteousness of their colonial project in the Philippines. This is particularly true in the case of the Virgen de Gea and more so in the Virgen de Antepolo. But unlike their Latin American counterparts, none of these images eventually develop into a rallying point of what would eventually become later on as nationalist or anti-Spanish sentiments. There are no records of any image of the Virgin, regardless of form, brown or white, that's what you, that was utilized as an icon of resistance to colonial expression. In general, it seems that the indigenous ways of expressing faith in the Virgin were tolerated and even encouraged by Spanish missionaries, as long as these do not clash with Catholic dogma. But I do admit that there needs to be more research on this as to the role of religious congregations, regional differences, and specific personalities in shaping the character of the cult of the virgins I specified here in this research. So with that, I, include, I conclude my presentation on the cult of the Brown Manola in early colonial Tagalog society. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat po sa inyong pakikinig. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, we will entertain questions at the end of this session. So you can write them in the chat box or in the Q&A uh, box of the Zoom platform. For our second speaker, who also has 15 minutes, uh, we have Danim, uh, Damin R. Maherano. Um, Damin Maherano ay nakapagtapos ng degree BA at MA um, sa Aralin, sorry, BA at MA ng Aralin sa Sining sa Universidad ng Pilipinas at meron din siyang MA sa Filipinology naman mula sa pamantasan ng lungsod ng Marikina. Siya ay kasalukuyang naglilingkod bilang Master Teacher 2 sa Senior High School sa Capitolio High School. Siya rin ang tumatayong Direktor ng Pananaliksik at Edukasyon na Samahang Saliksik Pasig Incorporated. Aktibo siya sa mga saliksik, konferensya at publikasyon sa lokal, nasyonal at international. So ating... Um, palakpakan virtually si Danim R. Maherano. Yes po, uh, magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Uh, ako po si Danim R. Maherano. Marami pong salamat, uh, Dr. Grace Barreto, uh, tesoro sa um, introduction, pagpapakilala sa akin. So, bibilisan ko na po dahil 15 minutes lang po ang kuminigay po sa atin. So, uh, gaya po ng um, presentasyon ni Professor uh, Austria, may kaugnayan din po ang aking presentasyon. Uh, ito naman po ay magmumula sa lokal na perspektiba, danas at mga kaalamang bayan patungkol sa Poon at Pista dito sa Pasig. Ako po ay laking Pasig. Um, dito po ako lumaki. Dito po, ako, dito po tayo naglingkod at dito po tayo gumagawa ng halos ng mga saliksik. At ito nga po ay initial lamang din na pag-aaral. Dahil nagkaroon po tayo ng pandemya kaya hindi po na ipagpatuloy. Pero sisikapin po natin kahit pa paano ay maipawid. Konting disclaimer lang po, ang ilang sa larawan ay nasa aking uh, pagmamayari at ang iba naman ay nasa uh, public domain. At simulan ko na po, bigyan ko kayo ng konteksto tungkol sa aking talakay. 
So may dalawa pong mahalagang lunan o lugar ang aking pag-aaral, initial na pag-aaral. Ito po yung Pasig. Pasig bilang ilog at Pasig bilang bayan o lungsod. So ang Pasig bilang ilog, kinikilala ito bilang maikli ang kaanyuan, ngunit may mahabang kasaysayan. Dahil alam naman natin na siya ang, ang ilog mismo ang uh, nag, uh, nagpadaloy no, sa, sa kolonisasyon, sa digmaan, at sa pagbubuo na muli ng bansang Pilipinas. So, hindi ko na po isa-isahin yun dahil iba pa po ang uh, Pasig uh, River History. At ito ay sa... Ang ilog ang isa sa mga katabigyan na nagkilang ng mga sinaunang pamayanan na tungo sa ganap na bayan sa konteksto of, uh, ng sinauna, pueblo sa konteksto ng um, Espanya, at lungsod no, uh, sa konteksto ng kasalukuyan. Naging sentro ang Pasig, ilog at bayan din no, ng, ng pagkakipagkalakalan uh, at transportasyon sa kasaysayan. At sa kasalukuyan po, partikular sa bayan ng Pasig o Lungsod, uh, ito rin ay nagpapatuloy pa rin yung mga kaalamang bayan. No? Nasa, nasa personal na kasaysayan po, gumawa po ako ng uh, pag-aaral patungkol sa mutsa ng Pasig. At may mga ilang validasyon po tayo no, na ang mutsa ng Pasig ay may kaugnayan din no sa aking uh, talakay pero hindi ko na po papalawagin doon. So sa, sa mga larawan nakikita po natin ang mapa na no, ang mga lumang larawan, ayan po yung nasa ibaba ang mga labandera na isang hanap buhay sa Idog Pasig. Ang Itikan, ayan, uh, trivia lang po. Yung Pateros po kilala po sa sa Balot, pero ang Itikan po ang itlog nagmumula sa Pasig. So kalakhan po ng mga baryo o mga ba, uh, mga barangay mga sa kasaysayan uh, dito po uh, inaalagaan ng mga itik na nagproduce ng mga itlog no, na niluluto at ginagawang balot sa pateros. So napakahalaga po nito no napakahalaga ng Pasig bilang uh, tunsaran o pinagmumulan ng hanap buhay. At gayon din mayaman din ang Pasig noon sa kasaysayan sa agricultural no na nagawain. At nakita po natin sa Larawan ang mga iba't ibang selyo na ginamit sa Pasig. No, ang Pasig ang naging sentro ng province of Rizal o probinsya ng Rizal ng panahon ng Amerika, ng mga Amerikano. At nahiwalay ito at naging bahagi ng Metropolitan Commission noong 1975 at noong 1994 kinilala bilang sudad ang Pasig. At sa kasalukuyan po ay namamayagpag po ang aming mayor na si Vico Soto no, na siyang sa totoo lang po, tumataas naman po ang kaso ng uh, COVID dito sa amin. Ayan po. So, yun lang po ang konteksto. Uh, gaya nga po nang nabanggit ko, uh, patuloy pa rin po ang pagdaloy ng kaalamang bayan o kwentong bayan o folklore sa, sa Pasig. No, bagamat kami po ay ganap na syudad o highly urbanized, uh, umangat pa rin po sa mga kamalayan ng mga ilang tubo o taal ng Pasig ang konsepto ng poon at pista. Sa pag-aaral nga uh, ni De La Paz, si Cecilia De La Paz, ang aking dating advisor sa thesis sa master's, hinirang ko po yung kanyang konsepto ng uh, alternatibong pananampalataya at pinalawig ko po rin yung kahulugan ng salitang poon. Uh, siguro po matutulungan ko din at magkaharoon din po kami ng pagdidiskurso ni uh, Professor Austria mamaya. Ayan po. Ang konsepto, maaari nating tignan na ang konsepto ng pista poon no ay essential no sa essential na labi no na hindi na sa nawasak o nasira ng kolonisasyon ng mga nagdaang kolonisasyon sa pag-aaral ko rin sa Sanghiang at sa Yosapoy sa Cavite na natili ang pagkukubkob ng mga katutubong kaalaman na halos katulad din po dito sa Pasig ito ay nananatili ang mga kaalaman sa mga manang sa mga taal at sa mga nagbibigay ng pagpapahalaga sa kapistahan ng bawat poon. At sabi ni uh, Batay kay De La Paz, ito ay kinilala niya bilang alternatibong pananampalataya. Tinatanghal sa mito, pagdarasal, pamamanata at pagdiriwang ng kapistahan. At ito rin ay sistema ng kaalaman, partikular ang mito ng pagmimilagro o paghihimala ang paggagamot at kakabit sa mga santo o sa mga poon. So gaya nga po ng nabanggit na, na ibahagi po ni uh, Professor Ostaya kanina, na kinikilala ito bilang artel na tibong uh, pananampalataya na labas 
sa turo o dogma ng simbahan. Sinasabi din uh, ni De La Paz na lantad ito, ngunit tago. Lantad sa paraan ng pag, uh, pag, uh, pag, uh, pagsasagawa ng kapistahan. So sa kasaysayan, alam naman po natin na ang ulat ni Doña Juana no, nung, ibini, nung dinala ang Santo Niño uh, sa Cebu, ginayakan po nila ito at nilagyan na lang ng uh, pagpapauso. So ito daw yung sinasabing uh, si kauna-unahang pag, uh, pagbabahagi ng lantad ng tago no, sa negosasyon ng mga katutubo sa mga dayuhang konsepto. At ito ay pinalawig ni um, John Clark no, doon sa konsepto ng mode of transfer. Sabi ni John Clark, hindi totoo, maaaring hindi totoo ang syncretism. No? Dahil ang syncretismo ay may paghahalo. Bagamat ito ay paglilipat lamang no ng kaalaman ngunit nananatili ang katutubong kaalaman no ito ay issue na naman ng pag-aaral sa pinerpinolohiya no o ano yung loob at ano yung labas pero ang position po natin sa, sa aking uh, pagtingin mula po sa sa initial na pag-aaral maaring may katotohanan ng mode of transfer kasi po nananatili pa rin ang katutubo no na na paniniwala na lumalabas sa mga salita ng sa salitang poon pagpapanata, manang, at marami pang iba. Kaya naman napakahalagang tignan ang salitang oon. No? Nakaiba sa salitang santo. Na ito ay may uh, control o konitasyon at denotasyon. Andali. Konitasyon at denotasyon yan na mula sa iglesia at sa poblasyon. So namamayani ang santo. So halimbawa, santo, uh, santo uh, Santa, Ma- ano ba? Santa Marta, Uh, santo Niño at marami pang santo. Ngunit ang, po, ngunit ang poon ay nasa bisita. Ang bisita ay ang mga kanayunan na hindi gano'o, na hindi gaano nabibisita ng mga praile sa kasaysayan. At sa poon, at ang konsepto ng poon ay napakahalaga esensyal dahil sabi ni uh, De La Paz, ito ay, uh, ito ay ano no, ng resistance no, laban sa panoptisismo ng iglesia. No? particular na nasa poblasyon. Hindi nakikita no, ganap ng kapangyarihan o ng mata ng simbahan ang mga sinasagawang pag, uh, pang alternatibong pananampalataya ng mga uh, taganayon o mga tagabisita. So, uh, samantalang sa Santo naman, mga imahe na pagmamayari ng simbahan, ito ay may konetasyong antiko. No? Alam naman po natin yan. Samantalang, kaya nga nabanggit ko po kanina, ang poon ay katawagang ginagamit ng mga tao na may masibiging paniniwala rito. No, halimbawa po dito po sa Pasig, ang, san, ang, ang Antipolo, hindi po namin yung tinatawag na bilang Nuestra. Poon, Nuestra Senora de Antipolo. At sa, uh, sa kasaysayan po, bago po iakyat yan sa, sa Antipolo, sinasalubong daw po yan ng Pasig. At meron po akong maaring dagdag pong pag-aaral. Professor, mamaya na po. <laughs> sa, ano, may, may, may dadagdag po ako dun sa ano nyo. Kasi po, ito, siguro yung konsepto po talaga ng kung bakit domesticado si uh, domesticado ang inang antipolo dahil ito ay bahagi ng bisita. Maaaring ganun po. Sige po, mamaya pag-usapan pa natin. Ginagamit ito, yan ang pagmamayari ng, ng mga pamilya o ng mga edit na alagaan ng mga paraniwang tao ng masa. At kadalasan po ang mga poon ay maliliit na rehilyosong um, eskultura no? na may kaugnayan ang konseptong ito sa nuno at apo. Na nangangahulog ang pag, uh, paggalang sa ninuno o kaya sa espiritu mula sa kalikasan o sa pinagmulan. So balik uh, upang bigyan ko po ng punto na no, mahalaga pong tignan sa sa talasagunian ang konsepto ng nuno. No bilang ito yung maaring pinagbabasihan no ng pagtawid ng uh, ng katutubong kaalaman mula sa uh, itsura o panlabas. Diyan, meron pa po. Kita mo sige, pwede pero pwede naman kayo lumabas-labas ng uh, ng santo o ng puon. So, ang salitang nuno ay tinatay ang kabilang sa proto-Filipinensyan na nakaugat, na may kaugnayan sa uh, wikang Austronesyano. Ang nuno, pagkakahate, matay kay uh, Manuel, 
ay angkin ang pag-uulit sa pagbaybay bilang katauhan ng wikang uh, Kastronisyano. Kasing kahulugan nito ang salitang anito na nangangahulugang espiritu mula sa kalikasan. Ang nuno ay isang pangalan na kinakabit sa lolo, lola, leleng, lota, lelang, inko, impo, apo at marami pang iba. Ito rin ay nangangahulugan bilang sanak, duwende, kapre at marami pang mga nilalang na, uh, na espiritu mula sa kalikasan, batay kay de Villa. Gayun din, tumutukoy din ito sa pinagmulan o ancestor, batay nga pa rin kay de La Paz o pinagmulan. Tumutukoy rin ito sa uh, lamang lupa o nuno sa punso, batay nga kay Quintanar, isang matandang nilalang na nakaupo sa punso. So gaya nga po ng anggono o anguno o ang nuno, yun daw po yung um, isa sa pinagmulan o kinikilalang uh, pinagmulan ng salitang anguno o anggono o ang, 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 ang nuno. Ayon pa rin kay, uh, kay Quintanar, nakaugnat sa nuno, sa punso, ang ekspresyon ng tabi-tabi po yan, uh, bago kayo mabunggo o sinasabing nakikiraan po. Ito ang sinasabi ng mga lalaki kadalasan bago umihi o ihian ang isang punso, bato, puno, anumang bagay na nagbumula sa kalikasan. Sinasambit din ito uh, kung daraan sa isang punso o kaya nasa loob ng isang kagubatan o kakahuyan o napadpad sa isang puno ng balite. Ang ekspresyon, ng, ang ekspresyon ito ay talama o lantad sa mga Tagalog at mga kalapit na rehiyon sa uh, Luzon na sumisimbolo sa paggalang, pagpaparangal sa mga espiritu ng kalikasan. So ito rin po yung initial na aking uh, pag, uh, pagtalahay sa aking isang publikasyon. So magpatuloy na po tayo. Ang nuno ay, natala, ay natala sa, sa kasaysayan. No? Ilang mga report ng mga praile, gaya ni Coli, ni Chirino, ni Plasensya, ni Desiniga sa kanilang mga relasyones de las Islas Filipinas, Gayun din ang mga traveler no na sina uh, Gemelli, Hagor, De Morga no ay nabanggit ang konsepto o salitang nuno o anito. Patay nga kay Gemelli, the Tagalog's anito, one anito being for the sea and other for the house. So napakaganda nitong for the house to watch over the children. No in the na- in the number of these anitos, they placed their grandfather and great-grandfather who they invoke in all their necessities and those uh, in those who actually honor and they preserve the title status of stone, wood, gold, ivory, etc. which they actually called as likha o larawan. So sa punto pong ito, napakalaga na ang kamalayan o at kaalamang uh, katutubo ay naisa dokumento ng mga uh, ng mga banyaga no at nag-exist na ito partikular sa mga tahanan so gaya nga ng nabanggit natin kanina no na sa mga bawat pamilya pangkaraniwang mamamayan no, na nasa bisita na hindi na namo-monitor ng uh, praile mula sa poblasyon no, sa iglesia so sa simbahan nananatiling buhay pa rin yung kanilang konsepto ng nudo o anito at ito po ay nabanggit no sa sa uh, sa pagbisita ni Gemel. At marami pa po na marami pa po 'yan. Binigyan ko lang ng halimbawa. Okay po. So tingnan natin yung cultural na manifestasyon uh, particular ng Nuno. Ito po ay uh, gumawa lang po ako ng pagtalakay din kanito ano hermeneutics linguistic play. No tingnan natin na maaaring sapat na yung kahulugan ng Nuno ay may kaugnayan sa Sorry. May kaugnayan no, sa aking pagtalakay ngayon. Ang mga nuno ay nakatira sa mga puno. Uno. Ang puno ay hindi pinuputol agad-agad sa bakuran. Sa paniniwalang nakatira rito ang mga nunong yumao. Magagalit ang mga pinuno o ang mga nuno ng kanilang mga angkan kung puputulin ang puno na kanilang tirahan. Kaya ito rin ang lunan para mabilis na makapaglakbay sila at makapagsubaybay sa mga buhay no nakaana sa pisikal na mundo darating ang panahon tatanda ang puno at maari ng putulin ang pinutol na puno ay gagawing poon no ito ay maaring uh, poong santo niño poong santero 
poong San Roque at marami pang iba. Sila ay ilalagay sa altar sa loob ng tahanan. Kadalasan kapantay ng mga ito ang mga imahe ng mga yumaong kaanak. Inaalaya nito ng pagkain, alak, at bulaklak bilang pagkilala sa kanya o sa kanila. Ito ang simbolo ng dalawang imahe ng mga ginoo o ng mga noo o ng mga pinagula ng kaanak na silang bubuo sa bayan at maglilipon sa lipunang tutungo sa pagiging sambayan ng Pilipino. So medyo ito po ay uh, pagtalakay ko no. Uh, yung ginamit ko pinagsasama-sama ko po no yung mga may kaugnayan uh, sa paksa. Okay po. Tingnan po natin no yung posibilidad ng existence ng puon at pista. No bilang alternative Hello? Hello? Yes, po pala tayo. Yes po ma'am, last one na po. Five minutes. Okay, thank you. Yes po ma'am, yes ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. So ito po ang pagoda ng Poong San Sebastian sa Pinagbuhatan. Ang kanyang araw na kapistahan ay January 20. Ang sunduan ng Poong San Santa Rosa de Lima yan, na uh, ng sumilang at bagong ilog. Ang pagoda no, ng, Santo, ng Poong Santa Marta sa Kalawaan. At lahat ng ito po, uh, ang mga barangay na ito ay may kaugnayan o nasa tabi ng ilog pasig. Kaya upang tignan po natin ng mas uh, mabilis ang pagsusuri, gumawa po ako ng talahan na yan no, ng pagkukumpara at pagkakaiba. So yung sukat po, halos kapare, magkakaparehas po sila, particular doon sa mga puon na nasa bahay. O pag mayari ng kapangkaraniwang tao, ito po ay nasa dalawa hanggang, tat hanggang tatlong talampakan. Batay sa pinagmulan o mito, nakita halimbawa ang San Sebastian na umaanod at, umaanod at nagliliwanag sa ilog pasig. Samantalang ang San, ang San, uh, San Rosa de Lima nat uh, natagpuan ng dalawang makangisda na malapit sa kweba ni Doña Jeronima na malapit sa ilog. Kaya po ang barangay Bagong Ilog at Sumilang ay naghahate o alternate po sila sa pista. So halimbawa po ngayon po ang nagpista ay Bagong Ilog, next year po ay, bagong, ay uh, Sumilang naman. Ayan po. Samantalang ang Santa Marta, bakit sa folklore, ginapi ang mapaksang buwaya sa idog. No, alam naman po natin sa kasaysayan, no, ay meron daw nag-exist na mga malaking buwaya sa idog pasi. At ang kanilang lunsara ng pista, kinilala bilang pagoda na sa idog at sa kalsada. Dahil nagbago po ang uh, itsura ng idog pasi, no, pinagpatuloy po ang mga pagpapagoda o kapistahan sa kalsada. At katawag ang poon sa bawat tahanan na bisita ay ang kin, no tinatawag po iyan ng ilan lalo na ang mga manang o ang mga taal na tagapasi. Samantalang ang pag-aalay noon ay ang mga pananim, mga bulaklak, isda at ngayon po maging yung tubig ay ginagamit ng uh, bilang ayo ng pag-aalay. At sa konsepto po ng pagpapanata sa kabuuan, yung pakikiisa po nila sa pagoda sa 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 kasunduan ay isang manifestasyon ng pamamanata, no? Nila sa poon. At sa kabuuan po, ito po ang tendensiya na maaring ang katutubong uh, katagalugan ay nananatili pa rin sa ngayon, no? Uh, bagamat mahalagang palalimin pa ang pag-aaral na ito. At dahil po diyan Maraming maraming pong salamat. Ang ilog ay tahanan ng mga punong bayan. Thank you po. Thank you very much, Danim. Uh, ko po maraming po salamat. Oo, oh, 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 mukhang maraming tanong ang mga tao. Dali uh, lang, ha? <laughs> maraming windows na buhat. Alright. Uh, so, yung unang tanong ay para kay Alain mula kay Ramon de Leon. Um, this is the same motif detailing the actions and habits of the Virgen Candelaria of Silang and would her Chinese Filipino complexion mark her to be amongst the brown Madonnas as well? Aling? Ah, we're well, referring to the original one in Silang, the one that is shown actually in front of the church. Uh, I think that would qualify as one because many of the um, the earlier images that were found 
uh, at least among the Jesuit churches in Cavite, have a tendency to be Sino Filipino and have a little um, dark complexion if you're going to compare it with uh, other images. So, yes, it can qualify as such. I'm speaking here of the primitive image, not the image on the altar, though. Okay. Um, yun ay galing kay Ramon de Leon at may pahabol siya, no? Meron po bang masasabi na ang birhen ng Antipolo ay tumigil ng ilang panahon sa isang simbahan sa Cavite Puerto bago din nila sa Manila at Antipolo? Well, birhen ng Antipolo po. Siguro <clears throat> after sumagot ni Alain, sasagot si Danim tungkol sa, dahil meron siyang komento tungkol sa birhen ng Antipolo. Kaya, okay. With regards to that particular uh, scenario, no, what we do know is that the galleons would normally go to Cavite Puerto because it's the port. So don muna yung dadaong. Okay? And certainly it would have stayed there. And then uh, 1626, then derecho sa Manila, where it stayed for several years. And then after Nino de Tabora died, it was transferred to Antipolo. And then... When there was a rebellion in 1639, uh, the image was desecrated by the Chinese rebels. Uh, it was thrown in a fire where, and it did not burn. So in order to protect it later on, it was decided that it should go back to Manila and eventually to Cavite because of the Dutch invasion. And um, uh, it stayed in Cavite for roughly a decade, more or less a decade. And, and then eventually started its rounds in the Pacific. And then, bumalik yan oh. sa Antipolo. So, technically, ang Birhen ng Antipolo is a traveling image. It's, it's associated with Antipolo, but it's practically everywhere, in every place. No? It's, so, it's a constantly traveling thing. Although, what, is, what we, are do, we are sure is that there is a certain sense of ownership on the part of the people of Antipolo. Um, every time they she would travel on a galleon or she would be brought to a place other than Antipolo is that you have to sign a contract. You have to sign a contract with the people of Antipolo and the parish priest that you promise that if you return safely, you are going to return this image immediately. Sabi nga ni Sir, no? They never called it a Nuestra Sir. They call it the Poon. Kailangan ibalik nyo yan because sa amin yan. Okay, so technically it stayed in Cavite for several years, um, but this was before the Soledad entered the picture. Okay, so many people are asking, so there were two patron saints in Cavite? No, um, the Soledad was not yet in the picture. It was not yet discovered when the Virgin of Antipolo stayed in Cavite way back during the Dutch Wars up until 1639 onwards to the 1640s. Okay, salamat Aline. Si Danim? Anong, sabi mo may komento ka tungkol sa uh, Birhen ng Antipolo? Sorry ma'am, ah, yun po. Um, paano ba? Tama po yung nababanggit ni Sir na talagang maaari natin tignan talaga na yung... Kasi po, ang, ang pagkakaalam ko po, Jesuita, uh, ang Antipolo po ay sumailalim sa mga Agustiniano. Tama po ba, Sir? Ah. Franciscans first. Franciscans, sorry. Mm -mm. Or may, may kaugnayan yung dalawa dahil uh, dali, hindi, hindi ko matandaan kung ano. Anyway, ang, ang pinaka-trust po kasi dahil nga kilala yung simbahan, iglesia ng Pasig noon, sinasalubong po yan dito. No? At lalo na nung panahon ng digmaan after, after the war. No? at sa sa kamalayan no ng mga taga yung mga mga taga poblacion kilala kinikilala nga po yan bilang mutsa ng Pasig daw mm -hmm. dahil sa babae no na palutang na lumulutang uh, actually nakalutang sa no nasa ilog at kinakantahan no sinasalubong binibigyan ng pag uh, ng mga bulaklak no at bago iakyat sa sa Antipolo at may mga claim po talaga na halimbawa po yung pag-aalay lakad ay may kaugnayan din po dun sa na dun po sa sa poon no at siguro po magandang tignan din yung relasyon no um, kasi ang hirap po talaga ng historical research eh. sa, sa totoo lang po yung local studies ma'am ma'am 
Kaya po mahirap po talaga. Kung baga, didiskurso ka talaga from the outside forces and they need to have the possibility. So, alimbawa, yung pagoda. Bakit may pagoda? So, influensya ito ng ng maaring uh, benerasyon, ah, tama ba? Uh, transformasyon, konversyon ng mga insect no, na nagkaroon ng festive at may folklore ito no, uh, na kinikilalang ah, uh, meron daw isang malaking ahas no, na lumabas uh, na walang ilog dati. Yan yan. Tapos, ito daw ay demonyo. Sabi, lumabas si San Franz, si, 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 San, um, si, si Tolentino. Tama. Oo. Uh, nakalimutan ko yung, yung, yung santo. At upang uh, iligtas sila, no, ay magpa-convert sila sa, sa katolisismo. So kaya nung nagpa-convert daw po, lum- gumawa daw po ng malaking lag- uh, daluyan at doon daw po nagsimula yung inugpasig. At bilang pasasalamat ay nagpista nga po at nagpagoda ang mga insect. Pero sa totoo lang po, ang paggaganyak ng mga palamuti sa sa mga bangka o sa mga sasakyang pantubig, malamak na po iyan way back. No? Yung mga badjaw po, yung mga lepa nila ay... May, may halos may kaugnayan na meron ng katutubong elemento. Bagamat siyempre mahirap talagang mangangke ng kasaysayan dahil sa kakapusan <laughs> ng mga historical data po. Kaya po ma'am, sa akin particular, yung konsepto ng poon, dun ko po siya talaga pinapasok. Kaya nga po yung binabanggit po ni Sir kanina na yung, pag, uh, yung pag-iitim, sabi ni Dr. Uh, De La Pazuzad, ito ay may kaugnayan sa likha no ng ifugao yung pag uh, pag, pag yung di ba po may ritual ng kanyaw ganyan tapos yung bulul ay nilalagyan ng ng ng, uh, ng dugo at kaya umiitim at sabi naman po ni uh, national artist Mohares uh, statistical po talaga na ginamit ang kulay ng kayo mangki para magpalaganap lumaki ang populasyon ng mga Katoliko ng panahon ng Uh, kolonisasyon. So, strategic po talaga. Thank you, ma'am. Sige, salamat, Danim. Um, dahil nabanggit mo yung kulay kayo, Manggi, may mga ilang tanong mula kay Kim Reyes at kay uh, na ipagsasamahin ko na, no, at kay Rona, mula rin kay Rona Repangkol, um, para kay Alain, at maaring sumagot na rin si Danim dito. Ang tanong mula kay Kim ay, of the various sculptural depictions of the brown Madonna, are there examples where the dark coloration was applied later and not the original intention of the craftsperson? Contrary to that, do we know if brown Madonna sculptures that were created intentionally to have dark skin? Yung kay Rona naman, the, um, on the possible intentional dark coloration of the images of the brown Madonna, can we also... Uh, wait lang, nawala. <laughs> can we also consider the choice of wood materials of the time? That perhaps the available wood material for sculptures of the uh, at the time were the only ones... Uh, wait lang, sorry. Wawala. Uh, so, for produces dark um, color that, para magkaroon ng dark skin. So, okay. Alain, yes. Okay, sige. I can only speak of the three cases that I presented, no? Let's go first with Mestra Senora de Guia. Okay, although I don't want ayoko pangunahan yung research ni Michael De Los Reyes na ipapublish within the year so ngamuna ako doon, okay? But um there seems to be evidence that the the the, the one in Ermita, Mr. Señor de Guilla had flake and stuff. Eh. So the, you have the mulave, but there seems to be some chip of what we call um lighter color because it is there are Images, remember all of these images are that of the Immaculate Conception. So uh, it's but normal na in the inkarnahan sila ng lighter color. So I think the the case of um uh, the Our Lady of Nuestra Señora de Guia is that it seems to be polychrome first. 
lighter, but because of age, the patina has literally worn off and what we see is the brown molave thing. The case of Our Lady of Kaisasai seems to be similar because the polychrome is still strong. So I presume that the brown face is also uh, painted with the lighter color, but because of age, remember it's, it's submerged in water, etc. cetera. Uh, it probably stayed that way and most people prefer it that way, okay? The case of Our Lady of Antipolo is really intentional because the wood was, the wood that was utilized was preferred because it has a natural fine grain and you will see that the Virgin of Antipolo does not have additional encarnas, etc. So it is intended to be that way. Very much like the Black Nazarene of Quiapo did not become black because nasunog siya or whatsoever. It was primarily dark in color because the wood that was utilized in Mexico was primarily dark in color. Uh, I am aware of specific cases, not in the Philippines, but in Latin America of particular images that were deliberately painted brown or black because they associated with particularly those sede sapiense, um, what they call this, um, seats of wisdom images. Uh, for example, um, okay, nag-iisip ako ng Philippine example. Ah, yeah, the one in Bohol. Okay. Uh, if you're familiar with Our Lady of Guadalupe in Bohol, it's not the Guadalupe of Mexico. It harkens back to a black Madonna in Spain. So it is carved. When it was carved, natural wood, sempre blue. But there is a deliberate way to really carve it pitch black so that it could harken back to the memory of the Extremadura image that is found in central Spain. So there are cases which are like that. Now, there are some cases naman na maitim, you know, they know that it is dark and then they would paint it white because they would like to restore it. And this happened in the case of so many Black Madonnas in Europe, no? wherein they tried to restore it to its original look and its original look is not dark. I mean, it's um, lighter color and the people get angry because they wanted it to be dark that way. And I believe there is also the same um, uproar when the Santo Nino was roared to its original Flemish look after centuries were in most Cebuanos are used to him, seeing him as a dark child. So marami mga possibilities na ganun. I think si Danny mas, marami, may masasabi din regarding this matter. Danny? Um, yes po, marami pong salamat. Nire-ref, ni, ni, pinabalikan ko yung article. Um, yun nga po, yung pag, um, well, ang tanong kasi masyadong positive, no? masyadong interest is based on the material. No? Uh, ako po tumi, tumitingin po ako dun sa mga posibilidad no? uh, sa hermeneutics na um, yung pag-iitim at pag um, pag o oh, sabi ng brown madonna or black madonna um, gaya nga po nang nabanggit ko strategical din ito no para sa converse uh, conversion at transport hindi na po na transformation conversion at paglilipat ng kaalaman no pero katutubo yung pagkilala na hindi nawawala yung mga nito ng paghihimala na may kaugnayan sa kalikasan Kasi halimbawa yung paggamit po ng, gaya po ng linguistic play ko kanina, yung paggamit po ng, ng puno, ah, ng matandang puno, ay napaka ano po nito, no? napaka Austronesiano yan. At may mga ritual pang pinagdadaanan niya. Alam naman po natin sa archaeology, bago po tayo mag-extrabate, di ba? Meron po tayo, <laughs> pagputol ka dyan ng ano, meron kang mag-idildil ka ng uh, dugo or whatsoever, ay... pasasalamat pagkilala dun sa halaga ng mga espiritu mula sa kalikasan na ito ay maaaring tumawid no at maaaring sinakyan no ng um, ng katol ng simbahan kasi parang parang ano po diyan eh uh, sabi nga ni Dr. De La Paz may hidwaan talaga yung simbahan at yung mamamayan sa konsepto ng puon no syempre i-reaffirm no ng 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 mamamayan na kailangan namin kailangan ilabas ang poon. Kailangan namin makita yung imahe na, no, yung kanyang itsura, yung pagiging brown niya na nakikita namin yung sarili namin at bumababa ang Dios para doon. Yung e ganung posibilidad po kaya may pagpapanata na iba yung iba yung turo ng simbahan, no? Na sa Australia nung uh, pagtingin ay napakatalamak po ito. 
no? Kaya nga po halimbawa yung Moana no na pinikula <laughs> ay napaka sorry po medyo nagkukulturang popular ako ay napakaganda pong ituro no yung mga mga paniniwala na brown no na brown skin at very melanin no at syempre kinikilala natin na yung kahoy ay ginagamit na sa, sa tehiya pero yung lalim no ng pananampalataya ay hindi mo ma hindi ma hindi mawawala. No? Kasi may mga may, may, may mga namamanata po eh. May mga matatanda pa rin tradisyonal mga paniniwalang nag-i-exist pa rin. No? Bagamat tayo ay nasa moderno po. Mundo. Yan po. Thank you po. Salamat, Danim. Dahil nabanggit mo ang mga puno, <laughs> uh, mula eh, John Marion Kapulitan, para rin kay Alain no? at kay Danim na rin. Um, does the prominence of trees in this finding stories can assume as can be assumed as remnants of ancient Tagalog beliefs on sacred trees groves or was it just a coincidence? Okay, danim mo na. Sige, danim mo na. Ito, hindi ko po nakuha yung ano ko, Greece po, sorry. Grove. Uh, okay. Ancient, ha, kung yung the prominence of trees in this finding stories, kasi yung nabanggit ni Alain kanina, uh, lahat yata ay ng mga nuestra ay nakikita sa mga puno. Uh, can can we assume that this rem these are remnants of ancient Tagalog beliefs on sacred trees? Um yes po ma'am. Kasi wait lang po. Sa so, totoo lang wala naman pong sa, sa mito wala naman po sa pag-aaral ko po ng mito ma'am ha. Bagamat babae talaga yung nabivictimize. Sorry for the term. <laughs> sa sa sisyo ng kasarian ay sa katutubong paniniwala po, alam po yung poong, yung, meron nga pong claim na itong San Sebastian din ay nakita din po sa sa puno na nagdiliwanag. Yun po palagi may liwanag at may puno eh lalaki po 'yun, no? Na kung titingnan po natin na sa sa sa, 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 sa lumang paniniwala at sa School of Thought and Anthropology, no na ang babae ay inuugnay sa kalikasan. So yung imahe ay nagpo-produce ng mga ng mga ganitong um mga ganitong paniniwala. At ito po ay sa tingin ko ay universal, no? At ang Tagalog po ay nandoon, no? At napakahalaga po kasi ng ilog, no? Uh, upang maging daluyan, no, ng pagkilala ng mga mito, ng mga himala, ng ganyan pong mga paniniwala. So halimbawa nga po itong Mariang Makiling at Mutsa ng Pasig ay may kaugnayan daw po, no? May claim na ganun. So paano? Eh, kasi literal ang ilog at ang Laguna del Bai ay magkaugnay. No, may may transport kaya daw pong magbanyo, ay mag-transport ng okay? parang ng diwata, josa, no? Bumababa daw ang Mariang Makiling at nagiging serena. At siyempre yung mga ganito ay sumasakay sa ganung paniniwala pa rin no, na hindi na, na hindi po ma, maalis-alis no na na nandiyan pa rin po so essential na po kung uh, sa, sa, sa archaeology iba po kasi talaga yung pagdiskus ay po talaga ng datos no ito po ay nasa folklore po at yung papaano po gumaga gumagana yung lipuna sa ganitong paniniwala yun po yung pinagmumulan ko po thank you po salamat danim alain Okay, uh, I think it's both uh, applicable. Yes, it is reflective of pre-colonial uh, beliefs, particularly on the sacredness of trees and the tree as the um, as a haven for specific deities and spirits in the native religion. But at the same time, we recognize that what is seen in the, the this native understanding of the sacredness of the tree is also universal because. In Spain, in Europe, in Germany, in France in particular, you also have stories of Our Lady appearing atop the tree. The three cases that I gave you, uh, the Degia appeared atop a pandan. The, the, when the apparitions entered eventually in the Kaisasa, you know, it was found in the river, it reappeared on a Sampaga tree, Sampagita. And then finally, the Virgin of Antipolo, you know, it's a Tipolo tree, okay? And this seems to be highly consistent when you talk about the concept of Marian 
shrines because up to the 20th, 19th and 20th century, even the more modern uh, accounts of Marian apparitions involve trees. Our Lady of Lourdes would appear on a cave above a rose bush. Um, Our Lady of Fatima appeared atop a whole milk tree. So it seems then there's even a cute uh, image of in Germany called Our Lady of the Bramble Tree. What is it in a tree? Some people are saying now that probably this is a universal archetype of the, the divine feminine and the life-giving concept of the tree, the womb, and the water, uh, which are universal symbols of the feminine. And so I agree that while this is reflective of something very pre-colonial, it may also be reflective of something universal that all cultures share. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Um, marami pa rin tanong no, tungkol sa kulay ng mga Madonna. Um, mula kay, kay Prof. Rosela Torrecampo at kay uh, Mr. De Leon. Um, ngunit ibibigay ko yung ibibigahagi ko yung komento mula kay Prof. Omel Hernandez para sa dalawa. No? So sabi niya, sa paniniwala po ng mga tao, hindi siya ang pipili ng puno, hindi mismo ang puno ang tumatawag sapagkat nasa loob niya ang poon. Mm-mm. Yung kulay po, tungong brown, ay nakikita ko bilang natural na tendensiya lamang ng mga material na ginamit tulad ng marfil o kahoy. Mm-mm-mm. Sekundarya po ang kulay sa debosyon sa isang anito. Yes, definitely I agree. Okay. Um, sige, mula naman kay Dr. Lineri para kay Alain. Majority of the Madonnas and their legends um, were recovered from a body of water. Have you considered the weathering process, considering that these are wood and organic and might affect the color or the overall appearance of the Madonnas? Actually, Dr. Neri, one major issue here is just how, just how common or how real are these discovery stories because practically every Virgin Mary in the Philippines would claim to be, are claimed to be fished out of some particular body of water. Let's presume that it is true. Probably, yes, it might have some, um, it might have some effect on that, but we don't have real material analysis of these particular images as to the role of weathering in their particular uh, image. Uh, this is very different, say, in the case of, um, since you mentioned being fished on water, you know, Our Lady of Kaisasai reminds me so much of a similar image in Brazil, um, uh, the uh, Virgen de Aparecida, which is also the Virgin of a syncretist Afro-Brazilian religion, you know. In their case, however, they were able to, since um, it stayed in underwater for long and they were able to actually analyze it and even were able to identify where it came from. So apparently they knew the type of artist, the the school. They knew that it came from somewhere in Paraguay and they knew that the dark color has something to do with the reaction of the muddy water with the clay. Uh, It's actually made of clay and all those stuff. We don't have that kind of so far as, as as far as I know, we don't have that kind of study yet um, in the Philippines. But probably, who knows? Uh, somebody might get an idea and study more on this. And uh, I'd like to agree very much with what Dr. Rommel later on specified that yes, uh, there seems to be no the even at that time, whether it's brown or not, may not necessarily be a big issue for both sides uh, because it's but a natural part of um, either artistry or the natural color of the wood. So they don't see images as a realistic rendition of the supernatural being it meant to represent. They see it simply as it is, it's an image. Definitely we know that the Virgin Mary doesn't look like that, but we still revere it as it is. Okay. Um... Mula kay John Francis Torre para kay Danin, sa kulturang kapampangan, ang salitang apo ay para sa mga lolo at lola. Kadalasan nila itong ginagamit din bilang pagtawag sa mga patron ng kanilang mga baryo. Isa din po ito bang isa din po ba itong pagtawid ng sinaunang kultura sa relihiyong dinala sa atin ng mga Kastila? Naalala ko may kaibigan nga kami si sa ASP si Ryan Melendres. Apo, apo ang tawag niya sa mga sa mga kanyang alaga. Mga alaga niya. Uh, 
Eh, ma'am, well, tingnan ko natin, Kapampanga, Pampanga, Ilog, Tubig, may mga remnants from bakas. So, yung pagbabakas po ng mga uh, nananatiling katutubo. No? Um, siguro sa akin po, magandang tignan din particular pa, pa, paano yung pagpuproseso ng apo sa kanila mismo magmumula. No? Kasi po, uh, makikita natin talaga dyan yung pagpapahalaga eh, na na masasabi natin identity ng ako identity pagkakilala ng, ng ng ano ng mga kapampangan no uh, maingay po talaga sa kanila yung apo bilang pinagmumulan o ancestor o nuno o noo yan forehead no ng kanilang grupo may may kaugnayan po iyan yan po may kaugnayan po talaga yan no ang tagalog at kapampangan naman po ay na, halos saksi sa akin magka may ugnayan po sa isa't isa. So, ito po ay shared culture na natin sa isa't isa. Yun po. Salamat, Dan. Ay, isip po yung apo kasi, di ba, ni Nuno, Nuno din. Hmm. So, yes, ma'am. maaring... Nagalog po kasi, ma'am, yung ano ko, ma'am. Oo, uh, uh, ayos lang. Um, pero yung sinasabi mong shared culture ay baka doon natin pwede tingnan. Oh, pag- shared culture, tingnan din natin. Sa yung uh, apo at Nuno. Opo, ma'am. Yung saka yung relative, relativism, baka po meron talagang specific particularity no bakit siya nagiging apo talaga kasi yung kaibigan ko din po ngani eh, apo malyari apo ganyan tapos may kaugnayan daw ito na nagmula do doon sa bundok ng Araya na bumababa so this folklore shared ulit <laughs> ay may kaugnayan sa isa't isa na ganun po kaya nga po halimbawa po tatanungin bakit walang epiko ang mga Tagalog halimbawa mapampangan doon na lang po tayo sa mga poon at doon po natin yung pag-ugnay-ugnayin ng story. Okay, salamat. Um, nais kong tawagin si Dr. Victor Paz na may tanong daw. Salamat, Grace. Um, may mga comments sa tanong. No? Um, una kay, kay um, Alain, no? very interesting paper of, uh, as always. Um, yung, agree ako no? na there's a lot of observation tungkol sa Baka itong, kahit do, limit lang natin doon sa tatlo uh, na uh, poon, ay, uh, at sinabi mo naman, painted originally. Ang, uh, sa akin, ang glaring dyan, yun, eh, yung ilong. If um, wala naman sa kalilang pango, di ba? Uh, of, all of them have aquiline, di ba? Aquiline. Process, and, 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 and so, really, yung, yung color is secondary, you know, doon sa... Mm-hmm. And, and reminds us of now yun bagong thinking na, di ba, about the classical statues na akala natin were all white when now uh, with the material studies I demonstrated that lahat sila were garishly, kala mo mga Pinoy nag, uh, nagpintura, no? very uh, <laughs> colorful, yes, all yes. of these cl- classic uh, Greek uh, and Roman statues. So, um, which then brings me to the point that uh, is moot. We, uh, wala ang difference really do sa itsura nung perihen uh, yung ku, who venerates them eh. Diba? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it cuts across. Kasi the veneration comes from the venerators eh. Not, mm-hmm. not, not from the enemies. Uh, so they, it, it is uh, incorporated by everyone. Diba? Uh, and, and they have their own meanings. No? And um, and which brings us to uh, that grove uh, a very interesting question a uh, point no uh, kasi nga there are accounts i, I remember no, re- reading accounts of early um, of the early uh, proselytizing spaniards who were were hitting or were very much against etong veneration i remember this is norte this may ilocos of groves Groves of trees, no? Mm-mm. And in fact, uh, the, the, I forgot the account, but and I could not forget your footnote ni Blair and Robertson. Sabi, uh, afterwards, uh, inambush itong uh, missionary. <laughs> Pinat, pinatay, pinagpapana, no? Um, pinapunta sa grove, and then inambush siya doon sa grove of trees na vinavenerate ng mga tao. And the grove, so it's not a singular tree. Some We have to imagine it also as yung groves is important. And let's not forget balete. No? Balete. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Eh, is up to now uh, very powerful. Um, yung kay uh, uh, yung kay Danim nga, uh, the, the fascinating ko sa slides mo nung 
So hindi ko alam na ang pinagbuhatan Pasig ay may ay sa San Sebastian nga ba? Yung, Opo. Yung nila? Na natatangi po yan, uh, Dr. Pas. Kasi po ang San Sebastian po kung survey natin sa buong Pilipinas, kami lang po ang may pagoda, may ilo. Talaga, no? nag nga ako na merong Opo. may San Sebastian Tapos, so eh, na, na, na gano'n pa, na, na pinaparadan. Opo. Pero ang mas, pong... Sige po. Nani mas importante, ang Republic Class Factory ba ay San, ay tabing ilog sa pinagbuhatang Pasig, correct, right? Pero Major malayo po namin po 'yon sa pista, ma- sa pista, pista. Malapit ba sa sentro ng pinagbuhatan niyan o malayo? Malayo-layo po, kumbaga para po siyang nakahiwalay pong isla pero nakaugnay po siya dun sa papunta po ng nagtayo. Sapagkat yung buong lupa na 'yan ay isang malaking 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 settlement in the 14th century, 13th century. We know because Wow. Dinurog ng pot hunter siya eh, at pinag-aralan ko yan. <laughs> so, isang malaking malaking site yan. No? Uh, 13, 14th century, 17th century, uh, and even earlier, may earlier um, horizon dyan. And, um, and so, that is the old passing, uh, and there's an old passing settlement there. At, uh, which then takes me to your, to your Santa Marta, uh, Santa Marta nga ba? No? Uh, yung may uh, no buaya. Santa Marta. 'Di ba? Yan ay may buaya, no? Opo. Pero yung pinaparada ba ay may buaya o wala? Meron pong buaya po sa pinaparada. Opo. Yung yung imahe mismo, no? Opo. Ang claim po kasi po doon, kinatatakutan daw po ang uh, pest determine po sa folklore ay pest daw po yung buaya noon. Ah, uh, kinakain po yung kabuhayan tapos kinatakutan. Uh. So nagkaroon daw po ng paghihimala, naging napili Ang Tamarta, kaya po nakatungtong, ganyan, nakapatong, ganyan. Eh, hey, oh, pero siyempre, bagong innovation, uh, uh, reading na yun, no, ng mga tao na, kasi yung buhaya, hindi naman masama, no, yung buhaya, okay, okay. okay. pero, may nabasa ako, ito yata, eh, kaya, pagkoda siguro, dahil, uh, kay Geroner yata, or someone, uh, may, may ina, meron siya sinusulat na account, kusan, there was a Chinese, uh, a person na may, may kaya and then uh, dapat dap na hulog sa ilog di ba tapos uh, imbis na namatay ay parang sinalba pa no ng buhaya and then ang ginawa nila gumawa yung family nag-sponsor ng ng simbahan ng chapel di ba ito yon opo kasama po yan marami oh. na pong, ano marami pong at sabi po yung simbahan niyo ay nasa Guadalupe po sa Makati so that means uh, so that uh, so yun ang talagang clear cut connection sa pagoda opo, opo. kasama uh, yun oh. <laughs> and 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 last si Danny dal total na diyan ka naman na nasa Pasig River as Pasig ka alam mo ba na may place name sa mapa ng Namria along the Big Bend sa Santa Ana opo, na hiyas hiyas ng nakalimutan ko and i've been trying my darnest to find out bakit nilagay pa sa Namria map yan no And then sinubukan ko hanapin talaga at tanungin yung mga pero hindi bigo ako no pero panandali lang naman yung paghahanap ko it's along the other side ng Pasig sa sa Guad, sa Mandulo yung side no hindi sa Santa Ana side hmm. at pag tinitingnan mo yung mapa may may place name doon ng hiyas ng X di ba and uh, eh para sa akin di ba hiyas gem or whatever marami hmm. pwedeng meaning ang hiyas eh no yeah. <laughs> Oh, pero hiyas talaga, Grace. Eh. Yes. I mean, oh. baka mutya rin. Um, uh, mutya nga. <laughs> oh, mutya. Akala ko nga mutya. No? Pero, pero something to look for, uh, baka makonek mo dito sa lahat eh, okay. ng pag-aaral mo. Meron pa nga po ako ngayon, bala ko po sa desertasyon yung malapad na bato na nawala. Ay, oo, oh, interesado <laughs> tayo. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yun po talaga, sabi ko, magpa-archaeological talaga <laughs> kung bato ko nag yes. Kasi ma- may, yung malapad na bato po at nakatapat siya sa um, Doña Jeronima. At si Doña Jeronima po, nung tinignan ko po yung mapa ng fault line, sa pool siya. Mm-hmm. Sa pool po siya ng fault line. So basically po, may kaugnayan kaya yung pagkakaro- pagkikreate ng structure. Tapos po, ma- tapos po, uh, Ah, sorry, dun sa geographical, uh, physical geographical uh, characteristic niya. Tapos po, dito po sa lugar nito, ang dami pong claim ng katatakutan ng mga folklore, ng mga himala, ng mga espiritu. Tapos po, meron pong um, yung hampas dugo, yung flagellation po sa Pineda. 
pati po sa local history ni, ng barangay, nung malinis pa po ang ilog, yun po nagdilinis ng sugat yung mga nagpa-flagellation sa tapat ng uh, malapad na batong na malapit sa doon na Hiron na, na, med, na, na nawala po. Nawala sa ngayon. So basically, yun po, may ganun po relasyon po talaga na maganda pong pagtagalan. Thank you po, uh, Dr. Hey. Paso po. Yan. Tama po yun. Tama po yung sa Republic Plus. Yan po. Tapos, Kung may lupa pang bakanti doon, although dinurog na yan ng one of the remaining professional patanting uh, family, no? Mag- magkakapatid sila at pinsan. No? Mga veterano pa ni Robert Fox sa Palatagan, yung panganay. No? Uh, at, um, uh, but that's an amazing settlement site. No? Amazing settlement. Sa settlement, daming burials. Uh, magandang pag-aralan. Kung may, uh, next time, uh, pag natunugan mo may development doon, Uh, punta mo na agad. <laughs> Private property po kasi yun. Do. Republic class. O, kaya mas maganda nga kasi da- dapat na protektahan. Pero okay. sa galing ng pot hunting uh, group na yon napakagaling sa PR. Ayop talagang na- napasok nila. Okay. Maraming okay. pong salamat. Thank you. May follow up ka Vic? Ay na. Uh, 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 magandang tandem yung dalawang talk. Na- nag-jive sila. No? Nag- oh, Okay, thank you. So may iba pa tayo ah, katong... Oh, yes pala, nakalimutan ko sabihin. Um, Alain, hmm. balikan mo nga si Ricky Jose at uh, Villega. Si libro nila, di ba yung santo? Oh, yeah, oh, si... hmm. If I recall w- w- correctly, they explained that the flowing... Uh, uh, flowing yung robe, it is a Chinese artistic uh, rendition. Yes, yeah. Uh, ang so yung kay kay Sai Sai ba, baka seems to be the, Chinese seems to be because of the robe diba uh, you would know because of the tilt yung parang sa Kuan Yin oh. may tilt ng konti so, oh. yung cloud spiral ang motif oh. tapos ang tendency is that yung yung kanyang yung hem ng kanyang robe yun yung tinatawag nilang clamshell motif yes. para siyang yeah in imbis na natural fold para so, siyang clam So obviously kay Sasai might be called in the context of Sino Filipino. Artisan artisanship, no? Artisanship is Chinese. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, gusto ko clarify, the clamshell motif is Chinese? Hindi yung yung so, robe, yung sa robe, yung, yung flowing robe, oh, yung, yung robe niya. Yeah. Yeah. Yung hem ng robe, yung hem ng robe niya, in business a western style na makikita mo na it naturally falls down tapos may paa. Ang tendency is that para siyang clamshell motif. You coined that term. No, I got it from from Pero the cross. Pero Filipino sa gumawa. Mm-mm. Yung sa ano, they saw Filipino? they saw the same pattern in Our Lady of Piat. Pag tinanggal mo yung damit. Okay. Ano ang so Filipino craftsmen ang gumawa? Chinese okay. Filip more likely Chinese Filipino Chinese, school. Chinese Filipino. Or, or Chinese na nakatira dito. Oh, de, gusto ko lang kasi yung clams are important also. <laughs> yeah. Hindi kasi ang hirap i-discuss. Paano ba ito, uh, Grace? Yung kanyang hemline, di ba? Yung yeah, meron, I can imagine. Yeah. Ta- yeah. Pero ang ano niya is pag ganun, yung unnatural, yeah. para siyang clamshell na. Yeah, kasi may mga, makikita mo yan sa mga grave, yung ibang grave markers or ibang, may mga uh, image ng Virgin Mary nakatayo sa actual, hindi actual clam, pero... Ayun, uh, ang ganda ng sin- shells talaga. Yeah. Thank oh. you kay Ryan sa kay Ma'am Tori Campo, scallop oh. hemline. Ayun. <laughs> Pero I prefer clam shell. Better term. No? Okay, hindi ka. Scal- thank you very much po. Okay, iba talaga pag may magsasanto dito yung mga kamarero, okay? Kamusta okay. na lang sa family ni Ryan? The beta ni family. Okay. okay. I see. Uh, wait, uh, sandali lang po. May mga questions pa tayo dito na Okay, Doc from Dr. Juan Rofes. Um, he is asking regarding the Saint Ro- Santa Rosa de Lima because when he was in Peru, uh, he was um, told that the patron of Lima and the Philippine Islands was Santa Rosa de Lima. But when he reached the Philippines, uh, he inquired that doesn't know anything about, no one knows about Santa Rosa de Lima. But I told him in the chat box that Santa Rosa is the patron saint of Santa Rosa Laguna. Um, any more? Maybe Alain or Danim can add to the answer. 
Well, the choice of uh, patron saints for Manila and the Philippines is primarily that of the Spanish. So when they cho the choices of the patronesses include Santa Potenciana, barely known to the Filipino, but she's a patroness of the Philippines, uh, Santa Rosa de Lima. But again, apart from Dominican areas where she is known, uh, hardly anybody knows who Santa Rosa de Lima is. Okay? But um, so secondary, patro secondary patron. No? So apparently it has something to do also with who chose the patron to begin with, because in the early stages, the choosing of patrons are sec is not done through acclamation, but rather it's done probably influenced by the personal preferences of the bishops or the higher ups of the Spanish church in the Philippines. It's not something that, that passes through what's uh, like a plebiscite among the people. So definitely it's different. Of course, the principal patroness is the Mary as the Immaculate Conception, and you're going to notice that all the three cases that I presented to you are interestingly Immaculate Conception images. Uh, all right, thank you. Um, we should have stopped like 20 minutes ago, but we are having a lively discussion, and I think uh, <laughs> the people are... Arsenio has are, a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I'm... Was like segue lang ako. <laughs> na, na people would uh, are still interested to to extend this. So yes, may I call on Arsenio? Hi, Alan. Kumusta? Kumusta, sir? Long time no see. <laughs> ang, ang tanong ko sa yon ay eh, yung bang mga imahen ay singkit? <laughs> Pag Chinese. Well, I was talking to Doctor. Uh, Jose, regarding this matter, no, it's an issue of whether kailangan ba pag sino Filipino ano yung singket. Merong iba na singket, no, but you must understand that you know the Chinese are also capable of adjusting to particular modes, no. Uh, remember when they are creating these santos, most of them also have models. Most of them, in most cases, Flemish models, no. So hindi naman necessarily na kailangan since sino Filipino ang craftsmanship sino Filipino din ang mata no not necessarily because there are so many ivories made and uh, of sino Filipino school na hindi naman singkit pero may mapapansin sila ng mga particular patterns na unique sa Buddhist iconography like um medyo flat ang ulo yung medyo malalaki ang tenga yung parang sa Buddha no um Yung fingers medyo malakandila, mga chubby-chubby fingers, mahahaba. Okay? Parang sa thai. Parang sa thai. Okay, may papansin nito doon. The lips are normally very small. Tapos ang preference ng Chinese, di ba, swerte sa babae, ang bilog ang mukha. You will notice that too. Okay? But not necessarily forcing it to the point na kailangan, since Chinese to, chi kailangan Chinese na Chinese din sila. Because remember that, even in Guangdong, even in parts of southern China, there are artisans which are actually making images of the Virgin Mary specifically for the colonial market. Mm -hmm. no? So they knew very well na hindi pwedeng singkit-singkit to because ang market natin is European, Filipino, Macanese, etc. So basically, uh, may mga iba na singkit, may mga iba na hindi, but ang tinitingnan karamihan, particularly Dr. Jose was very, very clear about this, ang tinitingnan niya is yung mga motifs like ang hair ba, paswirl, mm -hmm. merong, yun yung nangyigat ay pod, ang kulot ba may pagka-spiral. <laughs> Doon yung tinitingnan eh, yung kamay, yung belly ng baby, okay? Yung mga ganong mga bagay, tinitingnan nila yon Now, uh, it's also interesting to note that it's not always the Chinese Kuan Yin which is influencing the Mary. In fact, there are studies now which suggest that's the other way around. Uh, prior to the arrival of Christianity in Macau in the Philippines, Kuan Yin is always depicted as a single woman. Mag-isa lang siya. But because there is a market in the Philippines, in Macau, for the Madonna, meaning the virgin and child. Nagkaroon na rin ng bagong iconography, si Kwan Yin, wherein may dala siyang batang lalaki no? with, the role, with the idea na ito yung Kwan Yin na tagapagbigay. E kung gusto mo magdasal kay Goddess of Mercy, you can do so. But bakit kailangan may daladalang batang lalaki? Diba, in Chinese, 
a boy is preferred over the girl. And if you wanted to have a son, pray to Kwan Yin. And so nakikita mo that the influence is two-way. One influences the other and the other influences the other. So it's not a passive influence, but rather it's a give and take relationship between the two schools of art, uh, sacred art. May, Thank may you, sir. Pa. Alam mo bang may mga imahe ng mga Chinese ladies na natatagpuan na lang sa dagat. Pagkatapos mm-hmm. ng mga inchik, uh, uh, they, na, they build shrines in honor of these images sa Manila. Yes, yes. Hindi definitely. lang sa Manila, sa buong uh, kapuluan, sa mga, sa mga dagat. You know. mm-hmm. If you're familiar with Kaisasai, Kaisasai is probably the one that reached uh, what we call um, syncretist levels. Kasi uh, in 1639, the alleged apparition to Haipin, he's a Chinese hmm. laborer who was one of the victims of a supposed massacre in 1639. No? Um, they approved it. It's awkward no? after mong patayin, approve mo yung apparition that saved this Chinese guy from you Spaniards. No? But it was approved. Pero sa kanyang understanding, no, ang Virgin of Kaisasai is Matsupo, who is actually the Taoist deity of the China Sea. And so when you go there on December 8, may mga Chinese din na pumupunta doon because they believe that Our Lady of Kaisasai is a Christianized manifestation of a Taoist deity. So um, in fact, nasu- nalulungkot kami kasi yung isang temple dyan sa May Santa Ana ay unti-unti nang na- nasisira. Yung sa tapat, sa likod ng simbahan ng Santa Ana sa, La- sa, Namay- uh, sa Lamayan Street. No? Kasi namatay na yung last caretaker na hati-hati na at medyo nagde-deteriorate na. But that is also a shrine dedicated to the Virgin Mary as Matsupo or Grandma Buddha of the Seas. Isn't the one in Cavite City also found in the sea? Uh, uh, Soledad, yes, uh, allegedly. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Malawak you. ng ating ano, talakayan. Yes, ang, yes. 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 Ganda. <laughs> I, I hope that all the papers presented in this conference will be published soon. Soon, okay. hopefully, after yeah. the pandemic. At uh, alam ko, <laughs> Damien, <laughs> para kay Damien, sana ako ay makakapagsalita ng Tagalog katulad ng Tagalog mo. Napakaganda. Mm-hmm. Okay lang po. <laughs> um, okay, may tanong tayo mula kay Dr. Michelle Eusebio. Um, tanong niya para kay Dalin at kay Alain, yes. meron din ba sa Tagalog region na lumalaki na Birheng Maria? Kasi uh, may isang nagtanong, no? kasi sa Haro Iloilo, yung Our Lady of Tandem ay pinaniniwala ang lumalaki daw. So ito ba ay... Uh, lore to our children of faith or meron bang ibang beliefs uh, across the Philippines tungkol sa ganito? Ako, ay, ano ba? <laughs> Ako muna Anim. Po. Oh, sige, Danim. B- Bibigay ko na po. Kasi mo meron, uh, hindi po sa Pasig po, meron po hindi, uh, hindi sa Ina, hindi sa Mary o Maria, kundi ito po yung San, um, Santo, Poong Santo, Santa Cruz. So na sinasabi po sa folklore, mali daw po yung cross, natagpuan daw po ng mga magsasaka sa daang kalabaw. Tama ba? O daang kalabaw, batay sa kwento ng nanay ko at mga, mga lola. Kasi po natira po sila, malapit po dun sa pulo o sa San, Santo Tomas na magkalapit po dun sa baryo. Sa paniniwala po na lum, lumaki daw po yung poong Santa Cruz at dun po na-establish yung pagtatayo ng barangay na itong Santa Cruz po ay napakaliit. Kung tawagin nga po nila ay uh, bunting kalsada, yung kanyang old name. Kasi po, isang major street lang po siya no, na naghahati doon sa Santo Tomas at oh, yung pinakaduluhan po ng, wala kasi tayong mape, <laughs> uh, duluhan po ng uh, San Nicolas. Yeah, yun po. So, wala sa dito po sa Pasig o sa mga inisyal ko po, yung lumalaki po, yun po yung claim na, po, na meron po sa amin na mula sa maliit ay lumaki daw po ngayon. No? At hinuugnay po yun sa politika nga din po na nagtayo po ng barangay dahil sa ganun. At ang nakatagpo daw po ay kasama o magsasaka na, na nagtatanim ng palay ng mga palamin 
sa dating um, daang kalabaw. Yan, kung tawagin po, umuntig kalsada. So may ano na naman pong, alam niyo na, konektasyon ulit ng mga karaniwang tao. At poon ang tawag po nila. Yan, poong Santa Cruz. Yan, yun po. Marami pong salamat. Wala po okay. dun sa, ano, sa lumalaki po. Siguro po baka po may, may kaugnay. May kaugnayan po. Siguro tignan din po dun sa pag establish po ng pag expand din po ng kapangyarihan ng simbahan. Okay, thank you. Okay, Grace. Yeah. Um, nasabi niya na yung mga Santa Cruz, no? may napansin silang pattern. No? Pag simula sa Central Luzon, Pampanga, Pababa hanggang Tagalog region, patungo hanggang Kabikulan, may, wala tayong masyadong naririnig na lumalaking imahe ng Birhen tulad ng Candelaria sa Haro. No? Uh, bagamat may mga storya siguro na ganoon na hindi natin nalalaman o hindi natin nare-research. Pero may lumalabas na pattern, ito yung mga lumalaking krus kasi mismo sa Binondo may ganyan. Okay? Mga lumalaking krus, pattern yan, nasabi na yan ni Danem, ikalawa, eh, yung lumalaking santo sepulcro, yung kristo na santo entiero na patay na nakalagay sa urna na hin- eventually hindi na magkakasya kasi lumalaki, lumalaki, lumalaki. And this story seems to be consistent from Central Luzon up to what is the now Camarines Sur kasi meron doong amang hinulit which is the same, nagsimulang maliit, lumalaki ng lumalaki. Paano nila nalaman lumalaki? Kasi hindi nakasya daw sa case. So lalaki, lalaki, lalaki at lalaki. And most of them has something to do with this dead Christ, the cult of patay na Christo Christ lying in state. Nagsimula siya maliit. Actually, sabi ng iba, nagsisimula bilang kahoy lamang, tapos unti-unti nagkakaroon ng paa, muka, kamay, until nagiging fully developed, lumalaki, at inaalagaan in the same way as a real human being. Uh, I personally encountered that when we did a study on the Kalabanga uh, among Hinulid, but um, it seems to be typical of the southern Luzon area. Thank you, Alain. Okay. Um, all right, tayo ay siguro bilang pagtatapos no. Uh, gusto ko ang tawagin dito si um, Dr. Canilao at uh, yung mga ibang taga-AS. Nawala na si Lee at si Victor, pero meron kasing tanong para sa session 3 na sa tingin ko ay dapat nating ma-address no. Mula ito kay Dr. Tore Campo. Yung sabi niya ay what is ASP's general plan of action? regarding references to possible sites of investigation like the sealed up entrance supposedly to networks of tunnels in the Silang Cavite Church, Bukawi, and action regarding Spanish Revolution battle sites like uh, Pasong Paho or the unconcluded discovery of a mass grave along the plaza and skeletons in the ceiling of the convent of the church. Uh, pasong paho in silang that were buried by subdivision developments. Uh, I'm sorry, included stop masks along plaza and skeletons of babies in the content. Okay. Siguro uh, mga taga AS dahil ang tanong ay ano yung programa ng AS? Oh. <laughs> ay sige, Alain. No, no, no. <laughs> ah, okay. Si Mig siguro. Oh, ako na lang. Siguro I will speak. <laughs> uh, not for the entire ASP, but as a faculty member of ASP to end this session. Um, right now, um, to be honest, uh, we do not have a general program of action regarding the archaeological sites that were mentioned here. But each and every faculty of ASP, including the URAs and lecturers, if you approach them individually and even sell the idea or invite them to investigate sites, um, then we will do visit them. And then we can discuss or negotiate with the local government units or look for funding or collaborate with the local government units and scholars uh, from these places so that we can conduct these projects. Uh, that is the answer I'd like to share with everyone. So you can um, email us and hopefully we can visit the site that you mentioned. All right, so I think that ends our session for this morning.
thank you very much to our speakers, not just for the second session, but also for the first session. We learned a lot. I know that many of these papers are still in preparation, but I hope you can share them with us once they get published. We'd be very much happy to receive them, to read them, and use them as references. So I will now turn over the mic to Liz Aldian. Thank you so much, Doc Grace, our moderator, and to our session four speakers, Professor Austrian, Professor Maherano, and also to Doc Paz and Dr. Nicolas, and to all who contributed to that very interesting discussion. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry for that. And that officially ends the first part of session four and the morning sessions of day two. We will take a little more than a one hour lunch break before we start the next and final session of the conference. Uh, we will resume at 1.15 p.m. and you may access the webinar through the same link. So, so uh, thank you all for joining this morning's sessions and we will see you at 1.15 p.m. for the afternoon session.